acreditation. Quality is your thing. Acreditation is mine. So we have to really instill this in, in our um, universities and in the culture. Um, academic autonomy and financial autonomy for institutions, for higher education institutions, is so crucial to any education reform. Unfortunately, we, some of us at higher institutions, believe that autonomy or financial autonomy is the freedom to hire and fire, as the freedom to set, um, you know, our, to ask for, you know, or to get into partnerships or whatnot. But actually, no. Our academic autonomy means that we are free to, to respond to market needs, and to give and, and design those flexible um, 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 uh, courses that can make, can respond and equip students to the uh, to what faces them in the in, in the in the market, not actually the set of. Uh, you know, our students really study very well. They have very good um, you know, programs and whatnot, but they're not equipped to the market because they don't have the, st the soft skills that the market needs. And so basically, and I think, and this, and I'll just go very fast now because uh, I'm talking about, we're talking about flexible diagrams, uh, excuse me, flexible programs, uh, and you know, different learning techniques, participatory learning, lifelong learning. Um, we need to foster entrepreneurial culture. We need to start to, uh, talking about interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary uh, techniques and, 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 and fields. And of course, we have to bridge the gap between educational institutes, the academic milieu, and the job market. And this, of course, we have to work on leadership skills, communication skills, entrepreneurship, and lifelong learning. International recognition, that's one, uh, just a couple of words here. We've always thought, I've always, whenever I've been in office, everybody has been asking me, oh, we want international accreditation. We want internationalization. And I say, there's no such a thing as international accreditation. There is a recognition. And for us to be recognized, we need to have transparency that builds trust that leads to recognition. But the international accreditation, you can be accredited to those my friends and colleagues from the engineering school of engineering law. We can have ABIT accreditation, we can have accreditation from ACOS or from any of the German or French uh, or English uh, accreditation systems, but there is no such a thing as one global in international accreditation. So but what we need to work on, on is transparency, trust, and recognition. And there are certain things that we have to, and you do this very well at the AOC, I think, and that is in student involvement in everything. Until we in our institutions are aware that students have to be involved and sit on many of our faculty councils and department councils and have a, a strong student body and have them in our accreditation visits, other than that, we're not talking about international accreditation or international recognition. Quality assurance, of course, is the heart of all this, and um, I don't think I need to say more. And um, we believe from quality assurance is that uh, we can, through quality assurance, through what we believe uh, for, for what we're proposing, that we can really bridge the gap between education system, labor market, and even build international bridges between our education systems and the international job market, and of course, cross-border education. So, what next? We need to ask very simple basic questions. Why, who, how, and when? Why do we want to improve edu education, quality of education? We have to ask this question. I mean, I mean, yes, I know this is very simple, but actually there's no answer for that. Who should be involved and in what capacity? How can we build the, the bridges of trust? I mean, I've, I've thrown in very great, big ideas that I myself at Nuka, I'm struggling at Nuka to solve them. How can we build this trust? How can I measure market needs? How can I really predict what the market will need in five years? If you join the School of Engineering this today, you will graduate in five years. Jobs will have changed, technology will have changed. So how we can we predict this as an educational institute? How can we measure and compare between students' achievement and, uh, and progress in, in their employability? And when can we expect the results? And maybe this question I put back because of the quick wins that everybody is talking about. Um, so to conclude, um, 
education has long-term long economic and political and social gains, but we have to be patient. They are worthwhile waiting for. But the road is long and tedious. We really have to understand that and accept that. Quick wins are good, but they are not solutions. They are just quick, quick anecdotes that you can really, and I think, um, I hope I can say this publicly. There are political anecdotes that people win with and people can discuss, but actually the, the impact on education is not, is not that strong. Rather, uh, we need long-term visions and strategies, to, and, and this is our responsibility. This is everybody's responsibility. Nobody should think it's Betul Gauda the quality people know, or it's the Ministry of Education, or it's the Minister of Higher Education, or it's the Supreme Council. No, it's everybody's responsibility. And everybody here has a role. And everybody should always ask yourselves, do I have a role? What can I do? How can I share? And when can I start? Or where can I start? And with this, I'm sorry that I've been so long. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Johansson, for a very stimulating presentation and uh, conversation on the paradigm shift in education. And uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions and answers. So if there are any questions, discussions, yes, at the back. Mike? Do we have the mic? that are not seen in Egypt? Uh, or are we looking into something more like Scandinavian education system where the, the, the public education institutions are high quality but at the same time they're free? Okay, I heard the question. I think it's a good time for those who here. So I'm going to ask you to to 
the model where it is student and learner centered because the students have a say now because they are paid. You know, so maybe they, this might be a good model. And again, I, you know, this has to be of course discussed on a lot of level. And with, you know, in the economy, but it's not. But but there has to be a different pattern in the model that we have. actual resources, but the resources come with corruption and bureaucracy. You don't use it. The improvement in education, many of the improvements do not actually need money and sometimes actually saves money if we do them. I can give you one simple example. I don't know how in the world we ask kids who are 15 years old to determine their career. Choosing Ilmu, Adabi, Riyadh, Adabi, Ilmu at the age of 15. If we cancel the system, we will actually save money because we have the same textbook for everybody, the same exam for everybody, the same teachers for, for everybody. And this is just simply one example that we can do to save money and it will not cost money. There are so many other examples there that we can do without resources, additional resources, okay, and with, with population growth. In my opinion, population growth is an asset. It is liability in the short run, but it is an asset. If we develop it well now, We'll get the return 10, 15 years later. Um, I totally agree. And I do not blame lack of resources, nor population growth alone. Mm -hmm. I blame, I mean, the list I had is, and maybe what I listed maybe were some of the challenges that we have. But no, I, do, I totally agree with you. It's not population growth, nor is it lack of resources alone. Like you said, when it comes to, to schools, there is no, there, I, I know there is a lot of funds going into the school, and like you said, and I'm not going to say it comes with corruption, because I'm not sure about that, but yes, we are in a system that pays back those who uh, save money. So, so basically, and I've met, that, I met many people who told me that, is that basically they get the funds for the, um, for the school um, uh, maintenance, but if they return the money, they get, they get 3% or something of it. So basically, they don't spend. They just don't spend on the school maintenance because if they return money to um, uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance, they're rewarded. But then also there's corruption, but I'm not in a place to talk about it now. But I agree with you totally that we have to think differently and we, had, we cannot keep on with the same you know, thing it's money, it's population, and to be we can, we have to come out of this, uh, of this thing that we've, we're blaming ourselves for um, population growth. Yes, at the back, and then. Um, hello, I'm um, a student in Dr. Shirin Darwish's class, and um, education is actually the topic that we're talking about this semester. Um, at a certain point, you said that we should move forward uh, towards learning rather than teaching. Um, I ask you, uh, what exactly did you mean by that, and why? Okay. <laughs> okay. This is, uh, thank you. I mean, this is a good question coming from a student, of course. And maybe you might not, un you might not appreciate it because you are not, you are in a learning institute environment. environment. So this is what, this is what we want most of our institutions to be, yeah, to to do. You know what I'm saying? It's basically. Um, in our, in many, uh, it, de it depends on what the teacher says. So the teacher co goes up and, t and explains the lesson, and that's it. And the students memorize the lesson, and that's it. So that's basically what I, what I call te the teacher-centered, okay? Learner-centered, or the learning environment is a different, where you stimulate your students to think, and to do research, and to look, I mean, just a simple thing. Remember when you were young, when you asked your parents for the meaning of a word. Didn't you always get this frustrating answer? Look it up in the dictionary. This is learning. If your parent just told you the meaning of this word is so-and-so, this is teaching. 
And I give this example, my son was raised, I, my, I, I studied in the States for quite some time, my son who is older than many of you who are sitting here, so that you would know, okay, when he, he went to, um, um, uh, in the States he went to a Montessori school, and Montessori schools are, in my opinion so far, are one of the best learning, uh, learning environments. So he comes back, he tells me, mom, I want you to learn me, so and so, and I, get, I got so frustrated. It's not learn you, it's teach you. And then he goes and comes back. I want you to learn me another, you know, and it's like I'm getting so frustrated. And I go to the teacher and I say, why isn't he speaking good English? He is telling me I want you to learn me, not I want you to teach me. So she looks at me, you know, like this, because he doesn't, we don't teach, they learn. And I just felt so very embarrassed. And then after that, I understood what does it mean. So now you, you, you get my point. We don't have this very much in our institutions, and we need to move really towards that. Could I just add to that? I think this is, it's a wonderful question, and I think mm. um, one of the things that I often say to students is that we can teach you, but only you can learn. It's your responsibility. So it, in, it also creates a sense of responsibility on the part of the student or learner, and I think that's something to learn in itself that you have the responsibility to learn. And Thank also you. to add Thank to you. that, <laughs> you don't have to learn through teaching or through school because we're learning all the time. So we're actually learning, we're, we're, we're born with a brain set that allows us to learn in and out of school. But teaching is particular to an act that happens formally in schools. Yes. Yes. There was a question here, and Heather also wanted to Please. I have just a, a small a question about a very uh, interesting statement you said that many of the students that graduate don't have like communication leadership skills and you said lifelong learning. What are your suggestions for that? Whose responsibility is it? And I'd like to hear from you if you know of any initiatives about that, especially for the Egyptian universities. Thank you. OK. Um, this is a very an excellent question. And maybe I do not have the right answers. Um, because it's not only my responsibility or what I think. I think this is more of a, um, a collaborative work. And I think my colleagues in uh, education, schools of education probably know better than me that. But the thing is, in my opinion, is that um, what I saw, um, because I've taught in, several, in different institutions, uh, public and private, uh, national and international, and in the States as well. And, um, what I saw is that um, we do not, in our, our education system, public education system, from school all the way through the public uh, universities, we don't give the student the, the freedom or you know, the space to decide what they want to do. We just, they, and, and unfortunately, they have to take things, you know, just, you, you have to have the list of, you know, just give them, you know, the to, to-do list. and. Um, my background is architecture. Originally, I'm an architect. And so basically, in architecture, we cannot do this with students. And so when you ask the student, when they first start, design a house or design something or do this, for them, they are at loss because they never, nobody ever told them what, what to do. So yes, maybe part of it is more, it has to be in our curriculum, I think. Part of it has to to deal with reducing, oh, of course, a culture that's definitely reducing our the the amount of of knowledge that we want them to know, and they can know it elsewhere, you know. And uh, part of it is more extracurricular activity, helping them in engaging, you know, in uh, in you know the student students activities on campus. Uh, because otherwise, the, I think these are part, you know, like the societies that they form, like, uh, um, you know, the SAIF or whatever. They, these help them to innovate, to become entrepreneurs. And this is what they need, more than knowledge, because they can get the knowledge from uh, elsewhere. And of course, like Malak just said in my face, culture. 
we need to, and culture culture change is one of the mo and you know better than me it's one of the i mean the the most the the the, wor yeah, the hardest thing to achieve can i can i i'm sure. also i have to go but i just no, i love yeah. this so I, <laughs> there's something that auc has been doing that i think is um an, an interesting way to address that we have at auc what we i think correctly believe is one of the best career services operations certainly in this country and it's you know at least as good as most of the ones in the united states um, and several years ago we were approached to help develop career services or employability skills um, centers at several national universities so we couldn't do something as elaborate as what we do here the scale is too big and so forth but they had workshops for students um, and we did this with Ein Shems and with Suez Canal and a couple other places. So in about six weeks, the students are run through how to write a resume, how to do a job interview, you know, simple kinds of things like that. At the end of six weeks, the students said they were transformed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how can you be transformed in six weeks? I mean, that does, if you've never written a resume, you see yourself differently. If you've never tried to do a job interview where you say, this is what I can do for you, You've never, it is truly a remarkable experience. And I am of the conviction that if you could run all of the university students in Egypt through that six weeks program, you would begin to address the mismatch of the skills and the labor market because the students have the skills. They're learning engineering. They're learning, com you know, they can't get to the marketplace. They're not visible because they don't have a resume, they don't know how to present themselves, and so forth and so on. So this has a, and it's, the nice thing about this is, unlike extracurricular activities, which we obviously think are very important, that those things don't seem immediately practical. Doing something on employability skills, everybody will line up to do it because it seems very practical. They know they'll get something out of it. In the